I've hired a lot of bartenders. I can't teach them how to be friendly, but I can teach them how to make drinks. The way we dine has changed a lot in the last 20 years, and those changes are carrying over to the bar. There's a lot of pressure from the public lately for well-made classic cocktails, and there aren't enough well-trained bartenders to meet that demand. Just like a restaurant owner, manager, or executive chef, the bartender needs to know his craft in and out. An owner or a manager would never try to wing it in the kitchen. There's a lot of thought that goes to menu, staffing, outfitting a restaurant kitchen. That same approach is needed at the bar. This tape looks at the tools and the techniques needed to create both well-known classics and some new signature drinks, and also the know-how to create your own menu selections. So, let's start with the tools of the trade and how important they really are to building a great cocktail. Did you ever notice in the kitchen a chef unwrapping his tools, his knives, his his citrus strippers, his, his strip, whatever he, whatever he uses in his job. He's got that beautiful little uh, leatherette tool kit. What about you behind the bar? What tools do you need? Well, if you're going to be a shot and beer bartender, you don't need much at all, and there's nothing wrong with that. But depending on the kind of bar you want to run, if you want to do classic cocktails, if you want to do great cocktails, garnished classically, then you need tools. You need an array of tools. Let me show you what I mean. The first tool I want to show you is the most important tool, the tool that you need to master, the Boston shaker. Now I know there are a lot of other kinds of shakers out there and you might be using them in your bar. There's the cobbler shaker which is shaped like this. It's, it's kind of a one piece of fear that has a screw top that comes off. It has a larger top to build the ingredients and then you shake. I don't use a cobbler shaker uh, that often. It's a good shaker, it works fine. But I like the versatility of the Boston shaker and I think every bartender should train on the Boston shaker because it's very versatile. You can build your stirred drinks in the glass portion, your shaken drinks like so, and sometimes bars these days will actually send a little cobble shaker out to the table and let the guest or the waiter shake it right there and they'll leave it for the guest to serve himself. That's a nice touch. But let me show you about this shaker here, the Boston shaker. A proper tool needs to have a considerable overlap of metal over glass. Why? So that when I give it the little tap with the heel of my hand, it creates a seal, the magic seal. This is so important. If you can't create that seal in this shaker, you have the wrong tool. And it's in danger of flying apart while you're shaking, and it can actually be dangerous. How do you break that seal? Two fingers on the glass, two fingers on the metal. Take the heel of your other hand, and right at the very top where the metal and the glass adjoin, just give it a little tap on the metal, it'll come apart every time. Now you know what 90% of the bartenders in America don't know, how to use a Boston shaker. There are two strainers that go with the with Boston shaker. There's a strainer called the Hawthorne strainer, and it has a little spring around the edge. And it works pretty well with the metal portion. There's another strainer called a julep strainer, it has little holes in it. I'm sure you've seen it. By the way, try to find the big round one that has two tabs like that. Why? Because they fit nicely over the top and they don't fall in. And this, look, it fits beautifully over the top of the 16 ounce glass portion of the Boston shaker. What happens when we switch these? <laughs> Not so great. Uh, this doesn't really work with this part. That's why we have two of them. But do you know something? There's a lot of bars in America where you're lucky to find one, let alone two of these strainers. If you try to use the the, the Hawthorne strainer with the spring on this, you force it down inside and then you'll find when you pour, it'll start to sip out the sides and you'll pour all over the bar. So use them as they were intended to be used, like so. And what I will do is when I'm shaking a drink, I'll finish the shaking process, I'll break the seal, put that aside, and I'll strain that drink out of the metal portion of the Boston shaker. But if I'm stirring a drink, I'll build it in here because I want the guests to see, especially a martini or a Manhattan. I want them to see that beautiful color. I want them to see this drink being made right in front of them. And then I'll take my, my julep strainer and strain it right in front of them. Maybe a little jazzy swirl. You find your own technique and a little flip at the end. Give it a little drama, a little showmanship. Because after all, there's one thing I can't teach a bartender. I've hired a lot of bartenders. 
just because they were friendly, who didn't know much about making drinks, because I can't teach them how to be friendly, but I can teach them how to make drinks. So let's go on. We have the cocktail spoon. My cocktail spoon has a little bend in it. And I do that for a reason. I take the, the, the bowl of the spoon right here, the outside bowl of the spoon, I'll put it to the, when this is full, of, put it all the way down to the bottom, and that'll leave my spoon right over the center of the glass, and I can stir this drink without moving my hand, gracefully. Now, jiggers, you may have a free pour bar, you may never see one of these things. For a, for a beginning bartender, I would say, whatever kind of bar you're working in, start out using a jigger because you really need to learn your ingredients or you're going to throw a lot of liquor down the drain. Usually they have a three-quarter ounce and an ounce and a half or a three-quarter ounce and a two ounce. Get a couple of them for different drinks, different amounts. It really does tune you into where you need to be on this glass with the amount of ingredients for the glass you're going to use. So start measuring first so you can see. This, by the way, is not a New York Yankees souvenir baseball bat. This is called a muddler. And if you've ever made a caipirinha, that great Brazilian drink with the mashed up limes, or if you've ever had to mash up a, a cherry and an orange for a old fashioned, this is the tool you would use. And the business end is the flat end. You hold it by the handle here. Tongs, you should have a couple of pairs of tongs behind the bar to use for fruit. It is accepted that a bartender will squeeze a lemon or a lime into a drink. That's accepted. But if somebody wants an extra olive or an extra onion, it's nice to have the tong to drop it in the drink. Ice, they want an extra cube of ice. It's nice to have the tongs. You should always have them behind the bar. Keep your nails cut short. Keep your, your fingernails manicured. Keep your hands clean. You're, you're, you're working with your hands right in front of people all the time, and it's really, really important that they, they have a feeling that there is a tremendous amount of personal hygiene happening from that bartender. I have two knives here, a smaller paring knife and a larger knife. Why do you need two knives behind the bar? I'll tell you why, because sometimes I'll cut a big orange or a pineapple, and this little knife is not good enough for it. These are my knives. I bought them, and I keep them in my locker. I, I, I sharpen them. I think it's important to have your own tools if you're a bartender, the same as if you're a chef. This is my little nutmeg grater. What a great thing to have a nutmeg berry and a fresh grater. It's so much better than having that little shaker, which has maybe been around since last Christmas. Could be. Uh, I have my own opener, a big one for those big 46-ounce cans. I have my citrus stripper. Why? Because once in a while, I like to do something fancy in my champagne glass. Why not? They're easy to use, easy to learn how to use. There's a famous drink called the horse's neck. The horse's neck, named for this beautiful spiral of lemon peel that looks like a horse's head hanging over the edge of the glass. Horse's neck was traditionally bourbon, ginger ale, and a little dash of bitters, and this long peel of lemon. They made a non-alcoholic version up with just ginger ale and this long peel of lemon. But you can't make that unless you have the tools to do this. After cutting a long, thin strip off of here, I would take my paring knife and cut the thick strip and use it for my horse's neck. Prepare a few ahead of time, put them in ice water in the refrigerator. They'll spiral right up and look great when you, when you want to use them. I keep a little hand juicer behind the bar. Sometimes it's nice just to do that little squeeze of lemon when you're not busy. In my bar, I always have a big manual juicer. There's nothing quite like the experience of a guest walking in and sitting down and saying, I'll have a screwdriver. And you take an orange, cut it in half, and squeeze it right in front of them into the screwdriver. Do you know what an impression you're going to make on that guest? I'm not saying you're going to do that when you got four deep at the bar, but I'm saying early in the afternoon, before cocktail hour, when a couple of people wander in, why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you want to make them feel that much better about the drink that you make? The fresh squeeze juice, of course, is in pictures in the refrigerator, which was prepared in the morning by the bar back. But what a wonderful thing to squeeze fresh juice into their drink a la minute. After studying these old recipes, 
I found out that the only way to make a drink with fresh lemon or lime juice is with simple syrup. That's the formula that they used in the old days, and that's the formula I would have to use on my new job. And I found this out by trying to make a drink without simple syrup, where I would put a little teaspoon of sugar in my mixing glass, along with, say, three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice and a couple ounces of whiskey, and you shake it up. Well, what you get is a, a drink that comes up to about here on your glass. You don't have enough volume. Simple syrup provides sweetness and volume. And to make a fresh, sour, Collins, any type fizz, you need to have simple syrup. And they call it simple syrup for a reason. Everybody thinks that you have to boil it and cook it and reduce it. Well, you do if you're a baker. But we're not bakers, we're bartenders. And we use the syrup for a different reason, and it has a different formula. When a baker makes simple syrup, he might do it three or five parts sugar to one part water, and he might reduce that even further, creating a glaze, a really sticky syrup. We don't want a glaze or a sticky syrup. We want a thin, relatively thin syrup that has sweetness and will create volume in the drink for us. What I have here is a bottle with super fine bar sugar in it. Just to show you how simple it is to make simple syrup, when you're in a hurry and you just ran out of it at the bar, you literally can make it in a moment. Equal parts sugar and equal parts water. Put a cork in it, turn it upside down, shake the sugar down a little bit. You need to shake it for about two or three minutes and then set it aside. And in about two or three more minutes, it's going to look just like this, perfectly clear, and it's not going to have any sediment at the bottom. If it does, shake it a moment more and it'll be gone, and it'll remain in this form forever until you use it. Of course, my bar was so busy, this was gone in maybe two hours. When we made our drinks with sweet and sour, it was no problem. It was easy. You put an ounce and a half, two ounces if you're generous, of, of the spirit, and then a couple of ounces of sweet and sour, shake it up, and you're done. It's a no-brainer. But when you're using fresh lemon juice, it's a volatile ingredient. And you can't use anywhere near as much fresh lemon juice as you could use sweet and sour. Sweet and sour, after all, is 90% sugar and water, with a little bit of, unfortunately, artificial flavoring and other things. That's why we're moving to this fresh ingredient, because we don't want that taste. Don't get me wrong. It makes a good drink, but we want a great drink. I'm going to use 3 quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. That would probably break down to about the juice of a small or a medium-sized lemon into my mixing glass. You notice I put the lemon juice in first and there's no ice in there. There's a good reason for that. I like to know where it comes on that glass because you know as well as I do, you're not going to be picking up this jig very often when you're busy behind the bar. You need to see that line and you need to see that line for the most volatile of all the ingredients in that drink and it's the fresh juice. Any drink you're going to make with fresh lemon or lime juice, it has to go in first before the ice, before the booze. So I've got my lemon juice in there, now I need my sweetener. Bump the sweetener up by one quarter more than the sour. Let's put it this way. If you use three quarters of a part of the sour ingredient, you need one part of the sweet ingredient. And I don't care what the sweet ingredient is. It could be triple sec if you're making a margarita. It could be three different sweet liqueurs if you're making another exotic cocktail. But for the whiskey sour, it's simple syrup. So I'm gonna use the three quarter ounces, same as I did the lemon juice, and a touch more. You always want a little bit more of the sweet than the sour ingredient. We're making a whiskey sour, so let's get some good whiskey. The shot at the Rainbow Room was two ounces, so I'm going to do a generous pour. You probably have an ounce and a, ounce and a half shot in your bar. That's standard. We charge a little more. Fill that mixing glass with ice. We have smaller ice cubes here, so we're, we're going to shake a little a little less than I would normally shake, because I like big ice cubes. But with these ice cubes, now you notice what I did here? I took, this is a Boston shaker, and I took the metal portion of this Boston shaker, and I placed it over the glass 16 ounce pint portion of the, of the Boston shaker, the part where I always build my ingredients. And I just put it over the top evenly, and I gave it a little tap with the heel of my hand. Now watch what happens. The reason this great shaker works is because of the magic seal. The magic seal. If your, if your Boston shaker doesn't do that, you have the wrong tool. This doesn't overlap enough or it doesn't fit properly. If you can't make that magic seal, there's something wrong with the tool. But that's why this tool works so well. I'm not going to shake it like this. I'm going to turn it over. Why would I turn it over? 
Let's say I didn't turn it over. And I shook it like that. And I'm shaking away. And you know, the seal breaks once in a while. It happens to the best of bartenders. So that seal breaks, and the guy who's sitting right there is taking a shower with whiskey sour. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to turn this over. And if that seal breaks, and I give it another, just to make sure it's not going to break, give it another little tap with the heel of my hand. Now I'm going to shake this drink. And if it breaks, it's going to go over my shoulder, and it's not going to get everybody at the bar wet. But it's not going to break, because I know how to handle this tool. I shake to a slow 10 count. But since I've been yakking for about a slow 10 count, I'm going to shake a little less. Now, how do you break the seal? You ever see bartenders banging it against the edges of the bar trying to break the seal? I'm going to show you how to break it, and you'll know more than 90% of the bartenders in America. Two fingers on the glass portion of this tool, two fingers on the metal portion of this tool, and you'll notice there's a crack up here at the top. Find that crack with the heel of your hand right on the metal part, give it a little tap, and every time, it'll come right out. Now, I'm not going to put the ice that's in this mixing glass into this glass, because I've already melted that ice. I'm going to get fresh ice. And I'm going to take, in this case, my Hawthorne strainer. Hawthorne strainer is the one that has the spring around it. And the reason I'm choosing my Hawthorne strainer to strain this out of the metal portion of the Boston shaker is because it fits so well. It fits perfectly right on top of these little tabs. And I'm going to pour it right in there. we got a pretty good looking drink. I'm going to garnish with a cherry. I'm going to garnish with a flag. Do we know what a flag is? A flag is that classic garnish that bartenders use in a lot of tropical and sour style drinks, an orange and a cherry. That's a flag. Some people like to put it on the edge of the glass with a toothpick. I like to drop it right in. Your choice. So we have a pretty good looking drink here, our whiskey sour. And believe me, a pretty good tasting drink too. Martinis are real popular again these days, but let's define our terms. What are we talking about when we say martini these days? Is it the same gin dry with an olive that our grandparents drank? I don't think so. For a lot of people, let's say between the ages of 25 and 35, martini is a whole different thing. A martini is pretty much any drink that's made in this classic martini glass. Cocktail and martini have almost become interchangeable terms now. You go to a fancy bar and they'll give you their martini menu. 15 drinks, all called martinis. The Cajun martini, the chocolate martini, the the cosmopolitan martini, the metropolitan martini, the blood orange martini. These are cocktails, and they're putting them in the martini glass. I don't have any problem with that. They can call them whatever they want. What it shows me is that the state of my profession is at a much higher level than it was even a short 10 years ago. It shows me that there's a lot of creativity, and it's, it's all aimed at this glass, this beautiful martini glass. And as long as those drinks taste good, I don't care what they call them. I just love to see the bartenders out there creating and taking their profession seriously. It's a good thing. Well, we talked about the Boston shaker already, the two parts, the glass and the metal. I shook you a drink, which I strained out of the metal portion of the Boston shaker. Now I'm going to make something in the glass portion of the Boston shaker. That's the beauty of, the, of this shaker. I can build my Manhattans, my martinis, in this portion of the, of, the, uh, of the shaker. And there's something wonderful about getting that drink made right in front of you. Because a guy who walks in and says, I'll have a dry gin martini straight up with an olive and a twist, you know that he wants to see the ceremony right in front of him. That's part of the deal. And he's cheated. He feels cheated if he doesn't get that ceremony. So let's do it. I'm going to make one for you right here in front of you. Now, in this case, I'm not going to put the ingredients first. I'm going to put the ice first. I'm not using any fresh lemon or lime juice here. I want this drink to be as cold as possible. So I've got my ice in there. And the first ingredient that goes in is the splash or the dash or the drop. And that, in this case, is going to be dry vermouth. It was always a, a bartender's axiom for, for 100 years. I use French dry vermouth for my, Manhattan, for my martinis. And I use Italian sweet vermouth for my Manhattans. So we'll go along with that. I'm going to use a couple of dashes. Martinis, by the way, are getting a little bit wetter because of the size of the glasses. You can't put that much gin in a martini. Now, we come to a critical point. Oh, Noel, can I get a chilled glass? And I say chilled glass, by the way, because there's, if you're lucky enough to have a glass froster that freezes those glass behind your bar, you're a lucky person because there's nothing quite like, thank you very much, there's nothing quite like that frosted glass in front of the guests, whether it's champagne or beer or, or a cocktail. It's stunning. So now I'm adding my gin. 
And here I'm coming to a critical point in the, in the making of this martini. I've got to find a spot on the side of this glass that will exactly fit into that glass without throwing any out. Let's see how I did. Let me show you a little trick with the cocktail spoon. You might notice, if you look closely, that I put a little bend in the spoon. Let me tell you why. I take the back of the bowl of the spoon, I go to the bottom of the mixing glass, and I'm going to find that the tip of my spoon comes right over the center of the glass. And what does that do? That keeps me from having to go around and around with my hand. I can leave my hand in one place and stir gracefully without ever moving my hand. It's just a nicer presentation. It's a fun little trick. I'm going to stir this about 20 times. These ice cubes are smaller. If they were a little bit bigger and a little colder, I might stir a little longer, 30 or 40 times. Water content is incredibly important in a cocktail, especially a martini. If you were to take cold gin and cold vermouth and cold glass and cold olives and put it all together in a glass and you gave it to a guest as a martini, they would probably gag on it because that water content needs to be there to mellow out the drink. Now we come to the important part. Can I hit my mark on this glass? What do I mean by that? I mean, when I empty this glass portion of the shaker, can I get within a half inch of the top of this glass and not throw liquor down the drain? Now let me put some olives in here. And we're right where we want to be with this drink. But this gentleman asked for an olive and a twist. Uh, by the way, I'll put three olives in here. And if they want more than that, I'll put them on the side on a little caviar or garnish plate. Any more than that, it starts to look like a salad, not a drink. So I've got my olives, but he wanted a twist too. Let me show you a little trick with a twist. In my bar, I insist on all my bartenders performing this little ceremony right in front of the guest, flaming the orange peel. I'm taking a match, a lit match, and a, and a wide piece of lemon peel that's cut a very little pith, and I'm going to snap it sharply over the top of that drink and then drop it in. You notice that little burst of flame? That was lemon oil. Now I have a beautiful sheen of lemon oil on top of this drink. But not only that, the whole bar smells like lemon oil. And imagine in a darkened bar seeing that little explosion of light. Let me show you again. And the guy sitting over here says, what was that? And the guy says, I don't know. I ordered a martini. And all of a sudden, the bartender did that. And it lit up the whole bar. And some person down there says, bartender, I'd like to have one of those drinks. What was that? And these two guys who are strangers are talking to each other. You've sold two more drinks down there. What else can you do as a bartender by simply garnishing a drink? You've created the ambiance that you needed to create. With a little drama and the single garnishing of the drink, you've got strangers talking to one another. You've sold more drinks. You've done your job. I think it's invaluable for a bartender to see uh, the more unusual drinks demonstrated for them. And toward that end, I want to make a drink called the Caipirinha. The Caipirinha is a Brazilian, uh, it's actually pretty hot these days all around the United States, at least in the big urban centers. The Caipirinha is a drink made from an unusual spirit called Cachaça. Cachaça is a sugarcane brandy, if you will. It's made from a mash of fresh sugarcane. It's really, a, if you want to get technical, kind of a rum. Uh, just made rather than from molasses from a fresh mass of sh mash of sugarcane. Let's make this drink. It's, it's unusual and it, we get to use the muddler. This is not a souvenir Yankee baseball bat. This is a muddler and an important tool. I use it in a lot of drinks, even drinks that are not called for a muddler. Sometimes when I'm making a whiskey sour, I'll throw a lemon in just before I shake that drink up and give it a little muddle just to give the freshness and the feeling of a little bit of oil from the citrus skin in there. But this time we're going to have a lot of oil from the citrus skin. We're going to take a lime, take the little nubbies off the end, and then cut it right through the equator. Then I'm going to cut it through the pole into four equal wedges that look like that. I'm going to drop the wedges in the bottom of my glass, four of them. And the traditional way in Brazil is to take a teaspoon of sugar. They sometimes use brown or demerara sugar. Obviously, in a bar situation, you could use a teaspoon of simple syrup in its place. I'm going to do it the traditional way. I've got sugar and I've got lime in here. Now, what I'm going to do is muddle the lime really, really well. The idea being that I'm going to get a lot of oil from the skin as well as the juice. The oil in the skin is what creates a really unique flavor in this drink. And you know, uh, or let me tell you, that sugar doesn't dissolve well in alcohol. So getting the sugar pretty well dissolved now is going to make a better tasting drink. So now I've got a mash here of sugar, lime juice, and lime oil from the skin. Let me add my shot, ounce and a half, two ounces, whatever your call is, of cachaça. Now, a good way to measure this drink out 
I'll start with my ice right in the glass. Then I'm gonna pour the ice in here. Now I know I got a perfect shot. Create my seal, turn it upside down. This drink is traditionally made with cracked ice. These ice cubes are small enough to pass for cracked ice. Now I'm gonna pour the whole contents right back into the glass. The garnish becomes the limes themselves. Caipirinha. Really unusual, wonderful spirit. And now we got that lime oil and lime juice, a marvelous summer drink. Works for me. Well, signature drinks, I, I'm always talking about how important it is for the bartender to understand his ingredients, to be the chef of his bar and to be able to use those ingredients to make whatever, even, even making a drink for a customer a la minute. Give me an example from the Rainbow Room. A, a guy walks up to the bar one hot summer day and says, bartender, make me a gin drink. I, I'm, I'm tired of gin and tonic. Make me a new gin drink I can drink in the summertime. And I was busy, I, I, it wasn't a quiet day at the bar, and I thought for a minute, and I grabbed a little fresh lemon juice, deciding to start with something that resembles a gin sour. And I put about three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice in the bottom of my glass, and then I knew I needed a sweet ingredient, so I grabbed a little simple syrup, and I doubled up on that, plus a little bit. And now I've got a gin sour, I wanted to do something special for this guy, so I took a little bit of bitters. I just put a couple dashes of bitters in, and I know that that's going to change the character of this drink because bitters is a strong flavor and a good flavor, and you don't usually find it in a, in a gin sour or a Collins. And then I put my gin and my ice. And many, many years ago, around Prohibition, during Prohibition, there used to be a drink called Pink Gin. So this came out sort of resembling that. By the way, when you shake a drink, you shake it hard. As Harry Craddock, the famous bartender of the Savoy, said way back in the 30s, you shake a drink to wake it up, not rock it to sleep. And when they asked him, how do you drink a cocktail? He said, you drink it right away, quickly, while it's laughing at you. Well, it's effervescent and great looking. Now, look how great looking this is. Look at the color, first of all. Marvelous, huh? Then I just took a little, a little bit of lemon. He tasted it. I called it the gin thing for lack of another name at the time. And it became over that summer the most popular drink. And then I decided to put it on my menu. But one of my regular customers from the New Yorker magazine decided that the gin thing was just a little too pedestrian for my fancy menu and said, well, since you've got a Hemingway daiquiri on your menu, how about a Fitzgerald? So the Fitzgerald was born. And it works for me. What's the state of the cocktail today? What's going on out there? What are people making? It's been my experience that there's a lot of excitement in the cocktail area right now. And what do I mean? I mean, there are a lot of unusual older cocktails that are having a real rebirth. Uh, I'm talking about Pisco Sours. Ever heard of that one? Made with a grape brandy that's, that's uh, produced in Chile and Peru. Uh, I'm talking about Caipirinhas. It's a South American uh, rum-like beverage made in Brazil. Uh, muddled with lime juice and sugar. I I'm talking about uh, some of the tropical drinks that Trader Vic uh, glorified back in the 50s. Uh, those things are coming back and all the fancy garnish that goes along with them. And there's something else in the specialty world, the, the cooperation between the bar and the kitchen. What do, we mean? what do I mean by that? I mean that seasonally, I keep in touch with the chef and find out what's coming into that kitchen that might be fun to use at the bar. For example, uh, these beautiful white peaches came in, and I thought, wow, they're so sweet. I could do something really nice with them. Peaches and bourbon is a pretty good combo, so I'm going to try something and see how it works. So I'm going to take a little bit of fresh peach 
and a little bit of orange curacao, just for sweetener. And then I'm going to take my muddler, and I'm going to extract as much flavor as I can from these peaches and from this orange curacao, and add my shot of bourbon. and my ice. I'm going to call this uh, whiskey peach smash. I just had another idea. This might be good with a little lemon in it. Let's give it a shot. I'll shake the lemon right in there with it. All right, what do we got here? Mm, looks good to me. Then I'm going to take another little piece of this beautiful white peach. I wouldn't mind having that sit in front of me in the bar. Yeah. Rum, the first American spirit. And there was a genius of rum. His name was Victor Bergeron. We all knew him as Trader Vic. Well, Trader Vic opened his, his first store in Oakland, California, and it was called Trader Vic's. And one day, he was sitting at his bar and experimenting with some particularly good old rum from Jamaica. And he, he didn't want to change the character of the rum too much, and so he, he crafted a cocktail. And that cocktail was called the Mai Tai. Yes, the original Mai Tai. And there is a a restaurant in Hawaii that takes credit for the Mai Tai, but believe me, it was Victor Bergeron, and here's the story. He made the drink, gave it to some Tahitian friends of his who happened to be at the bar at the same time, and the lady picked up the drink, took a taste, and said, Mai Tai Roai, which in Tahitian meant out of this world. Trader Vic said, Mai Tai, that's the drink, and here's the drink. Let me make it for you. I'm going to use fresh lime juice again. And that formula that I've talked about, and we'll talk about again, of sweet and sour drinks, the formula that goes like this, three quarters part of the sour ingredient, I'm going to say this is about three quarters of an ounce, maybe a tad more, three quarters part sour, one part sweet. Now the modifiers, which are the sweet ingredients in this drink, are two. One is orange curacao. And when we talk about recipe, there are certain classic matches. Just like in the kitchen, there are classic matches. And curacao, rum, and lime is one of those classic matches. And I'm going to take a little bit of almond syrup. Almond syrup is used in a lot of Italian bakeries for cookies and things like that. It's used a lot in baking and in other applications. It's also the secret ingredient of the Mai Tai cocktail. There's nothing red in this drink. There is nothing beyond what I'm putting in here. These four ingredients, fresh lime juice, orange curacao, and a good Añejo rum. Añejo rum, I mean an aged rum, a rum that's at least a year old in oak. Your choice. About an ounce and a half to two ounces, whatever your shot might be. Let's shake it up. This is a shake and drink. We'll ice our glass. We don't want to use the same glass, the same ice, excuse me, that's in the mixing glass in the drink. You want to put fresh ice in here. The drink, you, the, the ice you shake with is going to be melted and a little bit uh, worse for the wear. Let's shake it up good. Nine, ten. I shake to a slow ten count. Look what happens to this drink when we get it in the glass. Little foam on top from the Orgeat syrup. What a pretty drink. Let's garnish with a lime wheel and a little fresh mint. I think Victor Bergeron used a gladiola. That's a little tough for the average bar. In the real estate business, it's location, location, location. In the cocktail business, it's recipe, recipe, recipe. I can't emphasize how important it is for a bartender to know and research the correct recipes for all these drinks. No, no less important than in the kitchen. We're about flavor just like the chef is. 
So you have to be a chef of your bar and find the right recipe. I'm going to choose a drink that every bartender in America seems to get wrong, the Singapore Sling. I've gone to bars and ordered this drink and heard bartenders say, gee, I think there's something red in it. What do we got that's red here? There is a recipe for this drink, and it's a complex recipe. And this is the recipe that's used in Raffles Bar in Singapore. Let's go through it now to see what the drink is really made like. I'm going to take a little fresh lime juice. I'm going to squeeze it fresh here because I happen to... About, about the juice of half a lime. That'll be just fine. I'm going to take a dash of Angostura aromatic bitters. And the grenadine in this case is really more for color than for sweetness. I'm going to put a dash of grenadine. There's my uh, flavor additives, if you will. Now I'm going to put my modifiers. Modifiers are, are larger ingredients that actually change the flavor of the drink a little bit. The modifiers in this case are Cointreau. And I'm using literally a half to a quarter of an ounce of each. A little bit of Benedictine. And then the key to the drink is Peter Herring Cherry Herring, a world-class cherry liqueur. I would avoid trying to substitute another cherry liqueur for this. It's really an important ingredient in this drink. Now we go to the base of this drink, which is gin. This is our ounce and a half or two ounce pour, or whatever your, whatever your house calls for. And that's the base ingredient of this drink. The juice in this drink is pineapple. Drink is a shaken drink. Let's get our ice in there. Let's ice up our glass. Usually served in a tall Collins style or, or highball style glass. Look at the color already. Watch this. I shake to a slow 10 town. Give it a lot of flavor and a lot of life. Watch how lively this drink is. Look at this color. Is this beautiful? I mean, who wouldn't order this drink and who wouldn't order another one? And yet, when I order a Singapore sling, it never looks like that. Let's garnish with a flag, the traditional garnish cherry and an orange. What a great looking drink. The sour drinks, that is to say the, the whiskey sour, the Tom Collins, the margarita, the daiquiri, uh, are the drinks really that separate, I mean, I'm talking about when you're using fresh lemon and lime juice, the drinks that separate the really experienced bartender from the inexperienced bartender. To be able to use this fresh juice, uh, this very volatile ingredient, and make a drink that is well balanced is, is a bit of an art. I'm working on a daiquiri here. I've got some fresh lime juice in the bottom of this, and I'm going to double that up with a little bit of simple syrup. Uh, this is not your usual daiquiri, because what is a daiquiri? It's uh, lime juice, sugar, and, and rum. There's going to be something a little more going on here. I, I've got my lime juice, and I've got my sugar. I'm adding a little bit of fresh grapefruit juice, not your average daiquiri ingredient. And I'm going to add one other important and yet unusual ingredient. This is called maraschino liqueur. And I'm not putting a lot in. It's a white cherry liqueur that has a stunning bouquet. Even standing here, I can smell it. It's, it's flowery. It's floral and wonderful. Now I'm going to put my, my shot of rum. And I'm going to shake this up. Oh, Noel, do you have a glass? Chilled martini glass. Let me get some ice in here. Now, here we go. And when you shake a drink, remember, as hard as you can, it should sound like a machine gun back here when you're shaking a drink. And it looks so good. And there's nothing wrong with smiling while you're shaking either. <laughs> Remember, you're supposed to be enjoying this. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Nice and lively. Effervescent. Beautiful. The Hemingway Daiquiri. It was called the Papa Doble originally, created down at the Floridita Bar in uh, Havana, Cuba, by a great, great Cuban bartender, Constante Ribolagua, during Prohibition. Let me have a little taste. Hmm. Here's the papa. Wow. Back in 1987, 
when I opened the Rainbow Room as head bartender, I put in place a cocktail menu, an elegant, long cocktail menu. And in Manhattan at that time, there weren't any other restaurants that had cocktail menus. The cocktail really wasn't that popular, to be frank with you, in the, in the late 70s, the early 80s. Uh, There's a lot of wine drinking going on, and that was a great thing. Wine was back. We talked about wine as a table beverage having been reinvented and, and a part of, of part of dining, but the cocktail was still on the fringes. The menu that I put together was made up of classics from the golden age of the cocktail, the 1850s to Prohibition, and some post-Prohibition classics, as well as a couple of signatures of my own. And those signature cocktails were really important as a part of that menu. As a matter of fact, I'd like to make one for you right now. Uh, cogn a cognac, uh, cognac cocktail. Noel, can I have a chilled cocktail glass? Cavalier came out with a millennium bottle of, bottling of cognac, and I had an idea for a cocktail that might take this brown spirit and broaden its appeal to a, a wider category. So I needed to do something unusual. And boy, did I ever. <laughs> I took a little bit of orange curacao, which, by the way, is an American an American spirit because the little bitter Curaçao oranges came from the islands of Curaçao. Even though the spirit itself was made in Holland originally, it came from an American product. And I put a little bit of that Curaçao for sweetness and a little bit of cognac. Equal parts. And this is a, this will knock you for a loop. I put a little pineapple juice. And I topped it off with a dash of something exotic and island-tasting Angostura bitters, which works in pretty much any tropical cocktail because it has all the tropical flavors in it. And then I shook it. And watch what happened. Nine, ten. A little trick about working with pineapple juice. It creates the most wonderful foamy top to any drink that you use it in. It's absolutely marvelous. Then, to give a little more exotic island feeling to the drink, I created a little fresh nutmeg on top. And finished off with a little caramelized orange oil. Now look at that. Why wouldn't you want to order that drink? Does that look great? Salute. Nice. This is just a small sampling of what you can do to bring your bar to a new level. Knowing the classics is just as important as knowing the latest trendy drinks. But most important, like in the kitchen, there has to be someone managing the bar that has the passion and the knowledge to maintain a level of excellence in product and to inspire the staff to do the same. So, take charge of your bar. Pay attention to the details. Your customers will notice the difference.